Hi, welcome to Yeshua's Wellspring. I'm Chris, I'm the Vice President here. I want to greet you today on this great day as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, blessings to you, everyone that is watching. This is not going to be your normal resurrection uh, teaching or Bible study. Uh, I thank you all for being with us and being a part of it. Uh, may the God bless each and every one of you that sees, hears, and listens. Uh, let's start with a prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for all those that are watching. Thank you for the word that you have placed within me and that is coming out by your spirit. I thank you, Father, for being with each and every individual that this word blesses them, encourages them, lifts them up, and gives them hunger for your word to keep searching and seeking the kingdom of God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, today I'm titled this message as, Are you a Pharisee or a Samaritan? <clears throat> and... It's very simple. It's a simple question. It's something to keep in your mind as we go through the Bible study today. Um, basing out of Luke 10, the Good Samaritan parable, which is where we will start. And then I'll just kind of walk you through and show you what, the, what God has showed me the last couple of weeks dealing with this parable. All right. So Luke 10, starting in verse 25. If you're all ready, we're going to start. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. And saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly, Do this, and you will live. But he, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise the Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took the, out the two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him? who fell among thieves. And the lawyer said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. One of the, what the Lord had showed me is he took me to verse 29, had me look at it and see and study it and look at it, that there are two things that are going on here. We have a, a show of someone who is, righteous within themselves or self-righteous and then we have a humble individual who is showing true righteousness so in verse 29 he says that he the lawyer who was wanting to justify himself said to Jesus and who is my neighbor two other translations that I've studied or looked at too one says but he the lawyer wishing to declare himself righteous said to Yeshua and who is my neighbor and another translation trans, translates it as this. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define my define neighbor? We all do this, especially in the Christian church. A lot of us are trained to do this. We're taught that the, we only take care of our own. We only take care of those who are children of God, who attend the same church as us, or the same youth group as us, or the same Bible studies as us. We only take care of those within our own little group or sect. But that is not how it goes. Another thing he was shown is certain when he talks about the priest. And the priest came down the road. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And the Levite did as well. Both of them 
were more concerned about ceremonial cleanness than they were to help a fellow brother. We need to be more concerned to help the brother that's fallen than trying to look holy and righteous before man. With that being said, we're going to go to uh, um, we're going to go to Genesis four nine, and we're going to look at what pride does, because self righteousness is a division. It comes from pride. It comes from self worth. It also comes out of fear. But pride is mean is really bad because we sit there and we try to justify everything we do. Now, in the story of Cain and Abel, everyone is well known that Cain killed Abel, and then God came to him. And in verse 9, it says, The Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your, bro your brother? And Abel answered, or said, I, do, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Two things he did wrong there. He placed himself pridefully above God. And two, yes, we are to be our brother's keeper. Whether male or female, we are to be the keeper of those next to us. We find a brother or sister falling, we're supposed to help them. We're not to, to put them out. We're supposed to at least reach to them and try to, bring, to correct the problem. If they don't receive correction, that's when they are um, put out of the fold. But not until that point. Uh, we'll go uh, continue on the self-righteousness and the part, are you a Pharisee? We're going to go to Mark 23. I mean, Matthew 23. Oh, <clears throat> Jesus. Oh. We're going to start in verse 1 and read through 12. And this is Jesus. And then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not remove them with one of their fingers. But they all, but all their works they do to be seen by men, to make their phys, uh, phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feast, the best seats in the synagogue, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi. I'm going to st stop at seven there. <clears throat> they love the praise of men. Self-centeredness, self-righteous. Self-righteousness seeks man's praise. Self-righteousness takes us out of God's blessing. It takes us away from what God wants to do for us. So in all things, we do not, it, it, we cannot justify we cannot make ourselves righteous we cannot direct where we are going we can only be what jesus has done for us and through him is our only way to be justified we are justified through his through him and the work on the cross we are made righteous through him on the cross it's because of the grace that god showed us by sending his only son that we have these things that we are once we receive but without him we have none <clears throat> but Jesus continues in verse 8 and he says, But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father and he is he, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teacher, for one is your teacher, the Messiah or the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted when we try to justify ourselves or make ourselves righteous it's just like pride we're coming to a fall god will humble you god will do whatever it takes to put you in the humility or you suffer the consequence of 
denying and being observant in an obedience to God. As we keep continuing going forward, we're going to talk with, uh, I'm going to go to, um, back to Luke 10. And we're going to look at verse 33. Or, uh, yeah, 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Compassion. You can't serve one another out of out of just self. You have to do it with a heart. You have to do it out of God, you, the heart for God. You got to do it out of love. And the only love that you can share is God's love. You'll fail. There is no law. There is no teaching. There is no ceremonial law that we can observe to bring forth God's true love. And I can show you where that is. And it was. And we're going to go to Colossians. We're going to read what Christ did, what Jesus did. In verse two, chapter two, I mean, through uh, starting at verse eleven. In Him you were also circumcised, and with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sinful sins of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ. <clears throat> Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in tre your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities, powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or drink regarding festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from which from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. You can't be following Christ. You cannot be Jesus. You cannot be following Jesus. If you're focused more on self and acts and works and law, bunch of do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts, you can't do that. You do that, you're going to hell. Well, if it ain't in the Bible, it's a lie. You got. You have to stay true. You have to follow Christ. You have to be Jesus. We are to imitate Jesus, no one else. We're not supposed to imitate that pastor that has a mega church or that evangelist that has a huge ministry and, th and whatever size plane or whatever it may be or what it ain't or whatever, how big the ministry. It doesn't matter how big the ministry is or how small the ministry is. We're not to imitate man. We're to imitate Jesus. We're supposed to show love for our fellow man. We are to show love to our fellow man. Not just those in our congregation. Not just those who have a weekly Bible study with us. Not just those who live with us. But that, but we are to love even the drug addict on the street. We're to reach out to him. We're to reach out to that guy who's in prison. That woman who's in prison. The dr those who are, are in prison. Uh, prison basically of alcohol and drug use, drug use we don't leave people out we're supposed to talk to them we're supposed to show them God's love you can't show God's love if you're super spiritualized and staying within your little country club and only treating the, those in the house right Jesus said 
if all we ever did was take care of our own, then what good are we even the heathen do it? I'm paraphrasing the scriptures. That's my paraphrase. But there's truth. It's in March it's in Matthew six when he's talking about do not worry about what you wear or what you will drink or what you will eat, but seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else is added to you. You can't be seeking the kingdom of heaven if you're seeking a man or woman. If you're chasing this teacher or that teacher or this minister or that minister or this evangelist or that evangelist or that musician or this musician or this worship team or that worship team or this praise band or that praise, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're seeking after those people continually and they get more of your time than the word of God does in your prayer time, that's your God. Not God. We're going to go to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We're going to talk about the subject of justification and salvation and righteousness, which is only through Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself that is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. <clears throat> it's because of Jesus that we do the good works, but you have to have a relationship with him and a heart for it. Otherwise, you're doing it all, as in the words of Solomon, vain. Um, I'm going to read a few other scriptures to you. I'm not going to ask you to turn to them, but I will I tell you where they're at, reference them for you. In Romans 3.28, it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. In Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.18, Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so th through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. In Romans 9.30, What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? <clears throat> Excuse me. What it boils down to is, they didn't follow a bunch of ceremonial laws for the righteous to be placed in righteousness or in right standing. They did not follow a bunch of ceremonial laws to be justified. What they did follow and to do is accept Jesus. They proclaimed him as Lord. They proclaimed him as God, Son of God. They proclaimed him and they seeked after him. That is what made them righteous and justified them. It's only through Jesus, it's only through Jesus Christ that we are justified, that we are made righteous. There is no other way. There's no other way to heaven. He's the bridge. He's the gap. Sorry. I don't care what other religions speak. He's the only way. He is one with God. He is Elohim, but he's also the Son of God. He is God, just as much as the Father is. He's the only way to it. He's the only way to heaven. Um, one more uh, on following the justification is we're going to go to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to read verse 10. We'll start there anyway. talking about the law and freedom. Samaritan or Pharisee? Pharisees focused on the law. The Samaritans were more free. For as many are as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is anyone, everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law and do them. 
but that one, no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not faith, but the man who does them shall live by faith. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become the curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. See, there's, there's also teaching you'll find in Hebrews that Paul taught, the, uh, the writer of Hebrews speaks of. And he brings forth the question of Abraham. Was Abraham justified by the law? Or was he justified by faith? And according to the word of God, it says in it, it, he believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So there's no other, you can't, faith is the only way to please God. The belief in who he is, amuna in, in Hebrew, amuna, faith, trust. That word means so much, but that word alone is what it takes to please God. We can't do it by doing a bunch of ceremonial works. <clears throat> Going to Sunday church every Sunday and sitting in a pew does not save you. Helping on that missions trip or whatever you've done without Christ, it doesn't save you. It doesn't make you holy. It doesn't make you righteous. If you're doing it without Christ and the love of God in you, then you're missing it. Apostle Paul was very clear in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 13. Everybody knows it. It's the love chapter. But at the end is the greatest sta statement of the whole chapter. And he says, And now by faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Because you can't truly act in faith without love. You can't truly trust God and his word if you don't have love for him. Even better, you can't fully believe that he'll fulfill his word in your life if you don't believe he loves you. See, there are things that leaders do and teachers speak. And the reason why the love is so important. There was a time when I was growing up, it was all about the love walk. That was actually the term used. Well, you just got to walk in love with that person. Sometimes they fail to explain what walking in love meant. And then there were some that didn't. But for some of us, we're thinking in the natural. And it's like, man, I really don't like that guy. I can't love him. Do you know what he did to me? Do you know, do you know how they treat me? God ain't interested in that. His way of acting in love toward that person or walking in love is pray for him. Bless those who curse you. That That's huge. When you're praying and you're praying and you're praying for a move of God in your life or you're praying for a move in your church, you're, you're praying that, God, I just want to be used. God, I just, I, 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 just take me. As in Isaiah, here I am. And it's so easy to say that word. And it's so easy to say it. But when you're not willing to let the cold touch your lips to cleanse you. Or the fire to burn out all the hurt and anger and hatred of what's been done to you in the past. You can't act out of love. 
Because you got to get rid of all that before you can even start loving yourself. And sometimes it's hard to love yourself if you don't know God loves you. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians and 4, and I'm going to start at verse 14. This is dealing with leaders. So those of you who have a Bible study, for those of you who have a small church, you call yourself an evangelist, you call yourself a pastor, a, a teacher, a prophet, they're all just fancy titles. Sorry. You may operate in the gift, but we are not to put the title before our name. Jesus didn't walk around prophet, teacher, healer. That's what everybody knew him as, but that isn't what he wanted to be called. We get focused on those titles way too much. All right. Chapter 4, verse 14. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For through you, for though you might, sorry, have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everyone, everywhere, in every church. I added a word there. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills. I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod, or in love and a spirit of gentleness? The answer that really that question is, is we're supposed to come in a spirit of love and gentleness. Sometimes a minister who starts a work from the ground up and hands it off to another minister. Sometimes they have to intervene because the one that they placed in leadership decided to do things their own way. That's kind of what Paul was talking about here. But I want you to understand that in some ways, you can actually read this in Jesus. It's God talking to you. He did not write these things to shame you. But as his beloved children, he's warning you. Verse 14. He didn't write it to shame us. He wrote it to encourage us, to warn us, so that we may know what to do. How to do in the times that we are living in. I'm going to go to Galatians 6. And uh, this will be my closing scripture. I'm going to read through 6 to 10. Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 6 through 10, verse 10. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, 
as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. To all. That means your neighbor who drinks, cusses, cranks the music up, makes it where you can't sleep. Maybe he throws stuff in your yard or they throw stuff in your yard or park in your driveway. Whatever they do to frustrate you. Love. But the key of it is, if we sow to the flesh, if we sow, keep living for the world, then we're going to reap the judgment that the world has. But if we chase after the Spirit, then we're going to reap according to the Spirit. If we're going to reap according, if we chase after the Spirit of God, if we chase after the kingdom of God, if we chase after Jesus and His way of life and the way He walked, sometimes we just need to go back to the basics. We need to get back to the Gospels and see how Jesus walked, how He spoke, how He healed, how He ministered, how He reacted to people so that we know how to react. When Paul wrote that letter and said, imitate me, he was the best, probably one of the best examples of imitating Christ at the time. But he was still a man. And then miss it. Jesus was God in flesh. So always go back to the go back to the gospels. If you're not sure, back in if some of you will remember back, there was a time where we had these little bracelets and they all said WWJD. And the saying was, what would Jesus do? That statement still rings true today. We sow to the Spirit, we receive everlasting life. We do good, and we stay focused, and we follow Christ, and we keep our love for God, and knowing that His love is, and we keep seeking Him out of our heart, from our deepest love, from our heart of hearts. You'll cultivate a relationship with Him and a love with Him that transcends anything that the earth has to offer, that the world has to offer. But trust me, He will bring back all the good that you've done. He will bless you. You will reap it. But you have to stay with Him. And for some of you parents whose children have walked away, that look like they're going down the road, Remember the simple scripture. Do not worry. Train them up as they, that's in Proverbs. Train them up in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart. They come home. They come home. Just keep praying for them. The hook is in the mouth. Just give them time. Just keep praying for them. And love them. Don't preach at them. Tell them how much they're doing and they're going to hell. Just tell them how much God loves them. And that He cares about them. And so do you. Um, that's all I have for today. I do encourage each one of you to cultivate a personal relationship with God, with the Father with the King of Kings. Get into that prayer closet and spend time. Get into that little room and open your Bible and just read it. Asking the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost to minister to you, to speak to you. And to show you things that you've never seen before to teach you let the Holy Ghost be your teacher but read because it to you the Holy Spirit can't teach you if you've never cracked the Bible the book if you never crack the Holy Scriptures he can't talk to you you need to get into it and that being said, I'll end us in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word that went forth. 
I thank you that you've touched every heart, every life that's watching and listening and has been with us today. Father, I thank you that you give them a hunger to know you more. And most of all, on this resurrection weekend, and for those Passover and Good Friday this week, Oh, what a good time and the blessing that we've had. Thank you for the sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus. Thank you for showing your love and your grace. For it is written, No, man, no greater love hath a man than he laid down his life for his friends. And you also said again in the book of John that you're no longer servants. You're now friends. Father, I thank you that we are your friends, and I thank you that we can have an intimate relationship with you. And I thank you for the bloodshed and the redemptive work of the cross. And I, more than anything, I thank you for the work that went on in hell that we read about in Colossians, and that he beat and he won and made a triumphant return. And I thank you for the power that you used when you raised him from the grace and sat him at your right hand. Where Jesus is today. And I thank you in Ephesians, we're in chapter 2, where it talks about that you have placed us with them. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for the blessing. And I thank you for each and every one of these people today. In Jesus' name. Amen.